Well, my father, David Crane, has been an evangelist for uh, several decades now, which is impressive since you're only 29 years old. It's, yeah, it's amazing. Um, and uh, that means that I grew up as a kid getting to hear basically every misdeed I committed uh, just being told to groups of hundreds and thousands of people as sermon illustrations, and I really appreciate that. So uh, what's awesome, though, about growing up as uh, the son of David and Betty Crane is seeing not just the ministry that God has used them to do all around the world, but also the fact that the life that they live is congruent with the gospel that they teach. And so I am really honored and excited this morning to introduce you to my father, David Crane. He is hilarious, he is insightful, and he's still doing great at, uh, at the age that you are. So yeah, so, so uh, if you're online, you know, put some clap emojis or just say hey in the comments and please welcome my father, David Crane. Hello. Uh, yes, I am the father of Pastor Josh. Bless his heart and all of ours. And here's what I just want to say to you this morning. Uh, uh, f for all of the inspiration that Josh is and for all of the joy and excitement and uh, intelligence that he brings to this church, just let me say, <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, uh, for the things you're not crazy about... <laughs> You can check with his mom. So here we are, and, and we've got this story of Jonah that we're going to be talking about. I just love the story of Jonah. And, and you've got a rebellious prophet, a prophet of God rebelling against God. Then you've got this huge fish, though I understand it's not about the fish. Then you've got, oh, my soul, this king who's so mean and a group of people who are so horrible. And I'm thinking, what else could this story have? And I thought, <laughs> a song. A song would be good. Man, if we just had a little banjo music. <clears throat> everything's kind of cold and dreary. Everything's kind of slimy green. Things don't look very cheery. All around me it smells like sardines. <laughs> I'm up to my neck in water. Man, this ocean plumbing must be on the blink. Well, Lord, this is Jonah. You just got to save me because I think this whale's starting to sink. <laughs> Jonah didn't want to, but the whale made him tell. Yeah. Jonah didn't want to, but the whale made him tell. He was told to tell the Ninevites of the Lord. He refused, so the whale said, again on board. Jonah didn't want to, but the whale made him tell. Now I'm sure you know the story of Jonah. Sit now down in the belly of that whale. And if you think back, I'm sure that you will agree that <laughs> it's a whale of a tail. Yeah, Jonah didn't want to tell God's story. It's not what he did wish. As a result of that, for the rest of his life, he ate steak because he couldn't stand fish. <laughs> Jonah didn't want to, but the whale made him tell. Yeah. Jonah didn't want to, but the whale made him tell. And through those big teeth, man, he thought he was dead. He was the first man to sleep in a water bed. Jonah didn't want to, but the whale made him tail. Now that's part of the story of Jonah and his rebellion against the Lord. So if the Father asks you to go in his name, you better go without a word. On that occasion, God used the great big whale. It was an awful lot of fish to tackle. But he really loves to use little fish like us. It kind of makes us holy mackerel. <laughs> Jonah didn't want to, but the whale made him tell. Yeah. Jonah didn't want to, but the whale made him tell. He spent the night in a room of mossy green. He was the first man to ride on a submarine. Jonah didn't want to, but the whale made him tail. And you know, really, it wasn't about the fish. He could have used anything. A snake, 
done that before. He might have used an elephant. They could have just sat down at Long John Silver's and gotten this problem corrected, yeah. He was swallowed by the world's largest belcher. God used him as Alka-Seltzer. Jonah didn't want to, but the whale made him tail, yeah. Jonah didn't want to, but the whale made him tail. <laughs> yeah, there's some theology you can hang your fishing hat on. Uh. There's all kinds of wonderful things behind the TV. I love that. Well, we're very glad to, to be here uh, today, and uh, thank you for allowing me to come. Josh, thanks for letting me come to speak to your people. Band, the band did a wonderful job this morning. We watch them every week from Texas, and we worship with them, and it's just uh, great to see them in person. They're taller in person, and so uh, we really enjoyed getting to be here live with them this morning. So a few weeks ago, uh, Josh called me and said, Dad, have you got a little time off? And uh, the, the answer was yes. I've had a lot of time off. I'm an evangelist. And, you know, when this virus thing hit, things just started to kind of drop off. And I saw that coming about January or February. And so I decided I need an outlet for what I do for ministry. And so I got a YouTube channel. And then I began to do YouTube channel uh, things every couple of weeks and uh, just some things from my heart to share some things and to sing some songs. And it was really a good uh, way for me to have an outlet and a ministry in the midst of all of this. And sure enough, things kept dropping off. People called in February and started canceling in March. And my whole year after just a few months was totally canceled. Matter of fact, a guy called from uh, uh, Alabama and said, Mr. Crane, we have to cancel the concert that you had. And I said, because uh, of the coronavirus. He said, yes. A lady called from Oklahoma and she said, we have to cancel the revival that we have scheduled with you, Mr. Crane. And I said, because of the coronavirus. And she said, yes. And a guy from Texas, my home state, called me up in a church where I was going to be later this year. He said, hey, uh, Dave, we have to cancel uh, the concert that you have scheduled with us. And I said, because of the coronavirus. He said, no, we heard you on YouTube and we just didn't think <laughs> we wanted you to come. So it's been a blessing and not so much sometimes. So yeah, Josh, I have a few days off. So what are we going to do? He said, well, we're going to do a study on Jonah. Oh, I said, I love Jonah. I love everything about Jonah. I mean, you got the, the, the fish and, and, and the king and oh yeah. Said, now what part do you want me to do? He said, well, I want you to do chapter three. I thought chapter three. We see chapter one, chapter two, cha oh, chapter three, Ch chapter three, Josh, that's, that's the post fish chapter. I mean, there's no more fish in chapter, chapter one, you got the pre fish, chapter two, you got the fish, chapter three, you post fish, no fish. I said, Josh, I, I would like to talk about the fish. And he said, it's not about the fish. It's about Jonah and his reaction to the Lord. And I said, yeah, but the fish. He said, Dad, you're doing chapter three. Okay. So with that thought in mind, if you have your Bibles or your devices, turn with me to the book of Isaiah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll show him who's preaching. Here's the thing. And, and, and seriously, don't turn there, but I do want to tell you a story from the book of Isaiah. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that Isaiah had kind of hooked up with the, the king, King Uzziah. They became really good buddies and friends. And it almost to the point where Isaiah was distracted from his calling by King Uzziah. And then in chapter 6, and if you get a chance this afternoon to look at it, it would be great. Isaiah writes, in the year that King Uzziah died... Sometimes our distractions are removed in order that we can refocus. God recaptures our hearts. He said, in the, king, the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Wow. Suddenly, everything was gone except the presence of God. And, and Isaiah saw, says, I saw him high and lifted up. And I heard the angels sing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Wow. I can't imagine that picture. And Isaiah, in the presence of God, realized his sin. And he confessed it. 
And he said, oh, Lord, in your presence. And that's what is so amazing about God. In his presence, our sin is revealed. God is holy. God cannot peaceably coexist with sin. And when we are around him, our sin kind of has a spotlight on it. And he said, I am a man of unclean lips. And I live in a country of people who have unclean lips. The Bible says with that, an angel came with a tongue and picked up a coal of fire from the altar. In the Old Testament, fire was a symbol of cleansing. And he placed it, that angel placed it right there on the lips of Isaiah. And he says, your sin has been cleansed. And then God says this, who shall we send? Who will go for us? Who shall we send to tell the world about me? Who shall we send to tell the world how much I love them? And Isaiah is there having just been forgiven. And maybe very sheepishly, he raises his hand and he says, Hey, hey Lord, this is Isaiah. Lord, here am I. Send me. That is not what this story is about. Matter of fact, this story of Jonah, complete opposite of that. God called Jonah. He said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to preach to those ungodly people and tell them that I want them to come back home to me. And if they don't, in 40 days, I'm going to destroy the whole thing. Jonah's response, (laughs) not here am I. Jonah said, I'm not here. And furthermore, I'm fixing to leave here and go somewhere else. And I don't care anything about those Ninevites. And by the way, that little thought and idea about maybe destroying a whole bunch sounds like a good plan to me. He hopped a cruise ship, which was not a very good one, and headed to Tarshish. Tarshish, by the way, check it out, it's in Spain. In the known world at that time, it was about as far as you could go. They thought Tarshish was the end of the world. So Jonah's going to go to the end of the world to get away from God. And you know what? Had he gotten there, you know who would have been there waiting on him. There's just nowhere to go to get away from. So you know the story. And Josh put it so eloquently last week about how he was thrown overboard uh, because of the storm and the fish swallowed him up. And for three days, he's in the belly of that old fish. Man, what a story. And as he's swallowed up, he begins to repent of his sins and acknowledge to God that he's not where he should be. And then he begins to praise God. And you know what? I have to really admire the guy for this. He didn't know what the outcome was going to be. He didn't know at any point that he was going to get to get out out of that fish, but in the depths of despair, he worshiped God. He even praised him. You know, some of us do the old thing, hey God, if you'll get me out of this, I promise I will never stray away again. I'll always be in church. I will always give. I will always be there for you. God just fixed this for me, and God intervenes in our life, and what do we do? Three months later, we don't remember any of the promises we made. Jonah didn't make those promises. He just said, God, I'm sorry. I realize what I've done is wrong. And he's thrown up on the beach. Thrown up on the beach. Wow. What a story. What a story of redemption. And that's where I want us to pick it up. Because this is really very cool. Turn in your scripture or here on the screen. Jonah chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. A second time. And I want you to get this this morning. God is the God of a second chance, regardless of who you are, regardless of what you've done, regardless of where you've been. God wants you to come home. I mean, those horrible Ninevites, that Assyrian bunch, he still wanted them to be forgiven. He loves his creation. And so the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. Verse 2, go to the great city of Nineveh. And proclaim to it the message I give you. God recaptured his attention. He reached back, grabbed him, put him in a place where he could talk to him. And got his mind focused on him again. Kind of like Isaiah. My mom passed away last year. And don't mourn because she was 101 years old. 101. What a great life. And she used to have a lot of funny little things she would say to us. Uh, Matter of fact, when she turned 100, she said, you know what I like about being 100 years old the most? And I said, no, Mom, what? She said, there's no peer pressure. (laughs) She's right. They'd all died years ago. 
When she turned 100, she came to my brother and I and she said, uh, boys, uh, what kind of birthday card are you going to get for me for my birthday? My mother loved cards. I mean, if you didn't have a card with a gift, the gift was insignificant. I mean, you could give her a brand new Rolls Royce and uh, where's the card? So she said, what kind of card are you going to give me for my birthday? And I said, well, a birthday card, standard birthday card. She said, that's the problem. You always get me a standard birthday card. She said, I can look back over the last many years and I can see all the cards you've given me. And you know what? They're just the same old stuff. They're mushy and they're gushy. She said, I am 100 years old. I'm tired of mushy. I'm tired of gushy. I said, so what do you want? She said, I want a funny card. I said, you, you, you want a funny card for your 100th birthday? She said, yes, I do. I said, well, mom, I don't think they make those because, you know, y'all shouldn't be laughing all that much. And she said, I want a funny card, and if you don't get it, I'm not going to read it. So I went to Walmart. <laughs> they don't have cards for 100-year-olds. I, I went to Hallmark. They didn't have any, but I finally found one online. And this is the card that my brother got for me, or for, I got and my brother got for our mom on her 100th birthday. This is what it said. <laughs> Congratulations on your 100 years. You've been a joy and a blessing to all of those who've known you all this time. Now on this, your very special day, we have a word for you from the Lord. <laughs> and when you open it up in big letters, it says, see you soon. <laughs> she laughed so hard, she nearly had a stroke. But here, here's what I'm saying. She had some great stuff she used to say. And whenever one of our family members or one of our church members would kind of stray from God, and God would do something to get their attention, this is what she would always say. Well, they had a come to Jesus meeting. And I got to thinking about, what is that all about? Sure enough, God put you in a position to capture or to recapture your attention. It's a come to Jesus meeting. Jonah had a come to Jesus meeting in the belly of that whale. And God said for the second time, hey, uh, Jonah, you remember that conversation we had a few days ago, you know, about going down to Nineveh and, uh, you know, preaching and asking for repentance and telling them they needed to turn to me? <laughs> yeah. I'm still going to need you to do that. Wow. He knew that Jonah had had a traumatic week. But see, here's the thing. God had not changed. The situation had not changed. The message had not changed. Jonah had to change. And, and this is what I love. Look, look at chapter or verse number three. And Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. Now, he didn't want to. He, he didn't care anything about it. He wasn't crazy about the Ninevites. They were so hard and cruel, and, and they had killed the Israelites, and the, the, their armies were so vicious and mean. I'm sure Josh shared all that with you last week. He didn't want to do it, but he did it. He obeyed God. And you don't have to agree with God. You don't have to understand Him. You don't have to even like what He's calling you to do. You just have to obey. This is what I've discovered. The doors of opportunity for us as Christians are huge. The world so drastically needs to know Jesus and his great love. But those huge doors swing on tiny little hinges called obedience. And when I refuse to listen to God, when I refuse to obey him, I go out of his presence and suddenly my life is just a mess. And this is what I know. The most miserable people I've ever met on the face of the earth are Christians who know where they should be with God, and they, yet they've consciously made a decision not to be there. That's direct rebellion, and it breaks the very heart of God. Jonah rebelled. God captured his attention, recaptured his attention. They had a come to Jesus meeting, and the Bible says Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. Now, here's the next little phrase. Listen to it. And he went to Nineveh. He went to Nineveh. And we think, oh, okay, just made the little trip over there and did his little preaching. But no, 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 get this. And I checked this out. The only body of water that allows you to go from Joppa to Tarshish, 
the closest that body of water comes to the city of Nineveh is about 400 miles. 400 miles. Before he could even preach, he had to walk 400 miles. Wow. He had a lot of time, I guess, to think about his calling, huh? He had a lot of time to think about a lot of things. Probably one of the things he thought about, which occurred to me is, God, why did you choose me for this job? I mean, of all the other guys that are here, Lord, why did you choose? Why me? Just a tiny sliver of an example. My wife, Betty, she's a wonderful woman. We've been married for 47 years as of September. Please, Lord, let that be right. I came home a couple of years ago and she said, uh, honey, I would like to get a bird feeder for the backyard. Now, let me give you the picture here. Uh, we're in Texas and we're on 50 acres of land that's been in my family for many years. We have birds everywhere. I mean, you can barely walk out the door with get hit without getting hit by a bird. I mean, we don't need more birds. And there's plenty of stuff for them to eat, apparently, because they're still hanging around. They're in the trees and the shrubs and the bushes. And, and, and besides that, l- let me just be honest with you today. There's a few things I don't care for, and one of them is a bird. I mean, they're just, they're kind of freakish to me. You can't look them in the eyes because they got one on each side of their head. You have to look them in the eye twice. I mean, get that they have eyes on the side of their heads. They're taking in two pictures at once. That's got to mess with you. And then in between the eyes, they got that beak. It's kind of like a weapon thing. And they fly. Oh, my soul. If we ever came up with a weapon like that for the military, we could dominate the world. They're frightening. And honestly, if you look at a blue jay, he looks a whole lot like a velociraptor to me. She made her case, and I just finally said, "Uh, honey, listen to me, and I love you. But i got to tell you the truth. I just hate birds. And there is no way in this earth or any other planet that we're going to have a bird feeder in the backyard. So the next day, I'm I'm on my way to Walmart to get a bird feeder. And I'm a little aggravated by the whole thing. And I said, Lord, (laughs) this is kind of a redundant thing. You kind of provide for the birds, don't you? I mean, you know, your eyes on the sparrow and you, if a bird falls, you know, I mean, really, Lord, you, you can, what am I doing? Why am I having to buy food and put it out there every day? And what's that all about? And God, in a very sweet way, just spoke to my heart. And this is what he said. You're right. I provide for all the birds. And for a little time, right here in your little spot, My provision for them is you. (laughs) Man, I just hate when that happens. He's just so right all of the time. And and I'm providing for these silly little birds. And you know what? It's been a blessing. I, I know all about birds now. I'm still frightened, but I know all about them. Very cool. And we're watching the birds and we get up every morning and we feed them and we have a great time. Actually, I enjoy the squirrels stealing the food more than the birds. But still, I'm, I'm into the birds now. And sometimes what we do in our calling is as much for them, it's for us. Jonah had all these things to think about, maybe. He's making that long trip to Nineveh. Look at verse Three, the last part of it. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it, three days to walk through the city. That was a huge, it was a metropolis at the time. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city. <laughs> he's not in this. He's a very reluctant prophet. So he's just like, uh, okay, I'm just going to go a little ways. I'm not going to go downtown where the courthouse is. I'm, uh, I'm going to the Target parking lot, and that's where I'm going to proclaim. And so he stands up, and, and I, this is why you need to understand this. Whenever I travel and I get a chance to go to a church or a conference or a crusade and speak for Christ, I'm very excited about it. I mean, I'm thrilled. I'm pumped. I just get up and, oh, listen, there's a God who loves you. He sent his son to die in your place. And if you'll come to him and trust in him, you'll be forgiven and saved from your sins. I, I just love proclaiming that. How exciting is that? <laughs> but Jonah, here's the sermon. You ready for this? Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. 
Excuse me? Yeah, 40 more days. And then it'll be overthrown. Eight words. Eight words in our language. Five words in the Hebrew language is what he was speaking. I don't know how you narrow a whole message down to five words. I, I just can't do it. I, I was at a crusade in Houston last year, and a guy came up to me after the service. And he said, Brother David, he said, I like you a whole lot better than that last evangelist that was here. And I said, why, was, why would that be? He said, that guy could preach for a whole hour and not say anything. He said, and you, you can do it in 30 minutes. <laughs> I want to take it as a compliment. I'm just not totally for sure. Eight words. Eight words. That was his message. Are you ready for this? Look at verse number five. And the Ninevites believed God. What? The Ninevites believed God. How did that happen? <laughs> How did that come about from eight words? What's the deal with that? You know what I believe? God was already there. You know, we talk about the calling of God, and this is what I discovered. When I yield myself to the calling and go where he wants me to be, I find he's already been there waiting on me. When my mother used to call me in for dinner at night, she was already there. If I call to you from across a crowded room, hey, come in this way. I'm already where you're headed for. God's already there. I think he had already disturbed the hearts of the people. I think he had already made his point in many of their hearts and minds. And Jonah just, Jonah just came in and kind of pushed it. Jonah got the blessing of that, and he didn't even want it. Hey, 40 days. The Ninevites believed God. Let's read on. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Now, you've heard the term sackcloth many times. You know exactly what it is probably, but I'm going to tell you again. When I was a kid, we used to feed the cows and the horses, and our feed came in these old tow sacks. And that's kind of what a sackcloth was. Sometimes made out of goat hair. It'd have a hole in the top so you can put it on your head, and a big hole in the bottom so you can get through it, and two armholes. And Matter of fact, Isaiah wore sackcloth his entire ministry. I mean, it was a symbol of mourning. But also, sometimes it was a symbol of submission. It was not comfortable. It was not made to be comfortable. But the people declared, a fast. Everyone must fast. And all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Look at verse 6. When I read this as a child, I thought... When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, and I thought, okay, here it is. This is it, buddy. This is where it hits the fan. He went from the whale to the jail. He's, this guy's going to take care of this. Listen to what it says. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne. Now, you need to know this. The throne was the sense of power. It was the symbol of the power of the king. He got up from his throne. He took off his royal robes. The robes, a symbol of his authority. He rose up from his throne. He took off his royal robes. He covered himself with sackcloth. He put on sackcloth. And he sat down in the dust. This king, a horrible king, a king of might and power, before Almighty God realized who the real authority was. He gave up his throne for the ashes that he sat in. He gave up uh, his robe for an old sackcloth of mourning and submission. This king is serious about his repentance. He didn't take it lightly. And he didn't want his people to take it lightly either. And this is the proclamation, chapter number, or verse number 7, that he issued to Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let, get this, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. <laughs> do you get what's going on here? The people are called to a fast. And now the king is making the animals fast. The animals. I got a dog, he's four pounds of terror, uh, we named him Timex because we wanted him to be a watchdog. 
but not an expensive one. And so uh, if I were to go to my dog and say, you know, I've done some really horrible things and I'm going to fast a little bit and wear some scratchy clothes. And you know, I would like for you to do the same. No eating today, no drinking. You're just, and I, I don't think he would take kindly to it because, hey, hey, pass the Purina and you go do your own thing. I just don't believe my dog would be into fasting. But the animals here were. Get this. <laughs> Verse 8. But let people and animals be covered <laughs> with sackcloth. Sackcloth. Joshua called me. He said, hey, Dad, we're going we're gonna to label your uh, sermon a little bit as animals wearing clothing. And I said, what? That, that's the title? He said, yeah. He said, you got something better? I said, yeah, I can come up with something better. Three hours later, I called him back. And I said, I like that thing about the animals. Animals wearing clothing. Why was that so important? Well, I, I believe, first of all, the king wanted a total fast and a total submission of everybody and everything. But you see the Assyrians, the Ninevites there, they worshipped animals. They had God-like deities in their animals. And this king was submitting the gods of his nation to the true God. Animals. No eating. Sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently upon God. Not just flippantly, not just as you think about it. Call urgently. Urgent means to put it in front of everything else. Nothing is more important. Let the people urgently call upon God. And let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Well, those were the only ways they had. They were a terribly violent country. But you see, this is repentance. And this is what I know Whenever you turn away from something, you must turn to something. And these guys, man, they were the worst of the worst. And yet God captured their heart and they realized their sin. And the king says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray urgently to God. And we're going to uh, give up our evil ways and our violent ways. We're going to replace that. And this is what I've discovered. When there's a change of heart and a change of mind from the presence of God in our lives, there's a change of life. There's a change of life. And the king says this. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? God may relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. That sounds a lot like the captain of the boat. Remember, he's trying to wake up Jonah. He says, pray to your God and maybe he will hear you and maybe we will not perish. Yeah. Who knows? Verse 10, the last verse. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, He relented. He relented. And He did not bring on the destruction that He had threatened to the Ninevites. If you have your Bibles open, you may close them. If you have your devices on, you may turn them off. I like to do that so people think we're nearly through. <laughs> he went to Nineveh. He preached. The people were repented of their sins. And this is what I want you to get this morning. God is a God of a second chance. And a third and a fifth and a tenth and a hundredth. Jonah the word of the Lord came to him a second time. Jonah given a second chance. But not only that, get this, that evil and vile people in Nineveh, those people, they were given a second chance. That's what God is all about. Lot, in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, was given a second chance, and he survived, though the cities were destroyed. King David, whom the Bible says was a man after God's own heart. He, he loved God and called uh, God his friend, and yet he had an affair with Bathsheba. He repented of his sins, and God cleansed his life. And the things that David did after that were greater than he had done before. Peter, the apostle, right there in the face of Jesus, denied him. And yet, he went out and wept. God forgave him. 
gave him a second chance. Maybe you've heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ all your life, but you've never done anything with it. You keep thinking one of these days I'm going to, but you just don't. Here's your second chance. Maybe today, today, right where you are, just sitting in your living room or having breakfast or wherever you may be watching this from, I want you to know God is the God of a second chance, and He once again wants you to know how much He loves you. He wants you to come back to Him. The Bible says we were created by God. He took the dust of the earth, which is the spiritual, breathed into it the breath of life, which is the physical. And the Bible says God created man a living soul. And I want you to notice the very next thing that took place. In the cool of the day, God came and He walked with His creation. He walked with us. That's your purpose in life. That is your reason for being here, to fellowship with God. And that's why some of you are so miserable in your lives. You've done everything except what you've been called to do. And tonight you'll lay your head on your pillow without God and you'll be heartbroken. You'll be miserable on the inside, looking for more. What am I made for? What is the more? The more is Jesus Christ. That's why you were made to be here with Him and walk with Him and know Him intimately. And then there's some believers here this morning listening, and they've really given their life to Christ, but somewhere along the way they got that distraction thing going. They, they got their focus in another direction. Sometimes their call is ignored because, well, it's not convenient right now. The calling of God. This morning, if you would like to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can do that. This morning you can trust Him. We have a website that we're going to put up that you can go to and you can uh, speak with somebody either uh, by a, a chat room or you can actually uh, call. We just want you to know about God's love. And this morning, if you're considering taking that second chance that God has given you to know Him, I urge you to do that. I urge you to know Jesus Christ in all of His fullness. But then I have one more thing I want to tell you, if you don't mind, and uh, there's this huge, humongous clock on the wall at the back of the auditorium, <laughs> and it says my time is up, but, you know, change the channel if you need to. For you believers who are here, who just kind of push God to the side, just maybe taking a vacation. Ah, I love the Lord. I'm going to do everything, but there's a few things I'm just going to maybe take some time off. Tell you a story and we'll be through. A few years ago, my wife and I found this beautiful lake in Arkansas called Lake Washita. It is so gorgeous. It has mountains and trees and valleys. It's just the most beautiful thing you have ever seen. We decided we wanted to maybe think about getting a houseboat now. <laughs> uh, some houseboats are really nice, really quality, but you got to know this. Uh, this one is not. I mean, it leans to one side, and if you bail enough water out, it'll straighten up for a day, then back over. Sometimes when the wind blows, we have like a sunroof at the top, and it's not actually built into it. I told my wife, Betty, I said, honey, this is our getaway. I'm with people all the time. There are crowds that come, and I counsel, and I pray, and I preach, and sometimes, honestly, I get a little weary in the work. And I said, we can just have a getaway. And for a couple of days, I won't be preacher David. And we can just go to the boat and spend some time together. I said, how about that? She said, well, we can try that. That sounds good. I said, now, listen, we got to walk all the way down to the dock. Our boat was in the cheap slip. It's way on the outside without a top in the blue. Every time the wind came around, we're way down. There. we got to pass all the other houseboats. I said, listen, Betty, don't make eye contact with anybody. Don't look at anybody. Don't wave. We're going to our boat. We're getting on, cranking that thing up, and we're heading out to the water. Just the two of us. Whew, little break. We're walking down the dock. I hear footsteps behind me about halfway down, and I'm thinking, oh, no. Maybe it's just somebody going to another boat, but they got louder and a little bit faster. So I punched her. I said, walk faster. Hurry up. So we're walking fast. We finally get to our boat. We get in, open the door, close the door, pull the curtains. Ha, ah, safety. And then I hear it. Permission to come aboard. Oh. I opened the door and put back the curtains and I saw a guy standing at the bow of the boat and I said, yeah, come aboard. Don't know the guy. Never met him in my life. He looked me right in the face and he said, sir, are you a preacher? <laughs> really? 
am I wearing my camp t-shirt? Do I, do I have my I'm a preacher hat on? I looked at him and I said, yes, I am. He said, well, I'm very sorry to bother you, but that first boat you passed on the right, that's my boat, and my wife is on the boat, and she's very sick, sick unto death in all honesty. And he said, she just wanted to spend her last couple of days on our houseboat. And he said, I think this might be her last day. And with urgency, he looked into my eyes and he said, could you come and pray for her? Yeah. Yeah, I, I can come and pray for her. Because that's my calling. I followed him down to the boat. I walked into the back bedroom and there she was, this frail little lady laying on the bed with oxygen in her nose. And She opened her eyes. I said, hey, my name is David Crane and I'm a preacher. And, and your husband tells me you're very sick. And she shook her head, yes. And I said, well, let's start off right. I said, tell me, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And her eyes just lit up, looked like sunshine had been pumped out of her. And she shook her head very emphatically, yes. I said, great. Then everything from here on is easy. So I prayed for her that day. I, I don't know what I prayed. I, I don't remember the words. I, probably for her comfort and her peace and for her husband. Uh, whatever that prayer was, I have no idea. And then when I got through praying, I looked at her and I said, maybe we could sing. Could, could we sing a little bit? And she shook her head. And, and I don't remember what I prayed, but I know what I sang because I always start with it. It's amazing grace. It starts with A. It's in the first of the book. And I began to sing Amazing Grace and, and, and I watched her and her lips were moving with mine. And every once in a while, I, I heard a word and we worshiped the Lord together. And as we sang and as we lifted our voice in praise, she stepped out into eternity. I'm walking back to my raggedy little old boat. And God said, you're never off duty. There's no vacation time. <laughs> you don't get a break. Aren't you glad you didn't miss your calling today? We belong to him. He is our Lord and Savior. Don't miss your calling. Let's pray together. My Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the joy that you give us. Thank you for the love. Thank you, Father, for the calling on our lives. God, may we never forget who we are or whose we are. And as we, your people, go through this life, may we realize that we have an obligation to people to tell them about you. Don't let us slack off. And Father, for those who've just missed you somehow. Give them this very day that second chance that you might be lifted up high and exalted. <laughs> Story of Jonah, yeah. It's not about a fish. It's about one of your children who's given an opportunity to do it again. Thank you, Lord, for that opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen.